Hello everyone, I'm Connor Henderson and I'm here today to talk about marketing strategy specifically around customer management, so managing customers through the relationship life cycle. And I have a special guest to do that, uh, Ian Toge is an um, expert in customer management, selling, sales, relationship development, and he works for a company that does uh, marketing or helps other companies with their marketing and with their customer acquisition. So um, let me pull Ian up here. Um, Ian, please introduce yourself. Give us a little bit about your background. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Connor, Professor Henderson, for having me having me today. Appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I'll give you a little bit of background into myself. Um, I went to college at Carroll College in Helena, Montana. Beautiful, bustling metropolis there. Um, got to spend some time over in Spokane occasionally with uh, with some friends at Gonzaga, including Connor. So that was good. Um, after Ma, or sorry, after I uh, graduated school, um, I started out at uh, Northwestern Mutual, just selling financial planning. And at that time, like, who wanted to give money to a 22 year old? Uh, nobody. So it wasn't very <laughs> successful there. But I did learn a lot about selling, um, relationship building, um, follow up, you know, communication really. Um, so that was uh, kind of the building blocks for everything that I've learned since then, uh, related to sales. And so from Northwestern mutual, I ended up getting a job at a company called data sphere technologies, where we basically sold advertising to, um, to real estate agents and other, other marketing professionals, um, from there, ended up getting a job at uh, Amazon, where I was for four years. Um, again, kind of uh, helping Amazon sell, you know, their advertising solutions to a number of different customers. Um, and then after my time at at Amazon, uh, I just I joined a company called Moz, which is where I'm at today. I've been there for about five years. We've got uh, a suite of uh, all-in-one kind of SEO toolkit that helps large brands all the way down to small and medium sized businesses manage their um, their website, their inbound marketing efforts, um, just to, to make sure that your site is set up as well and as optimized as possible so, so that search engines can um, interpret your content and drive searchers to your website. So if I, so yeah. if I'm, uh, I get in a car accident and I'm mad at how my, uh, insurance company handles the processing of the claim or whatever and i decide i want to switch car agencies i'll go into google and search for uh car insurance or whatever and then you're going to help your client be the company that comes up in the search results and make sure their page is well designed to get me more interested in potentially using them yep okay. absolutely we're going to try and make it so that your page is the one page that shows up when you search for need new car insurance near me or something. Along and then lines. do you consult also on like what the landing page is like and what's the kind of initial experience for some newcomer to the website? Is it like how far down the funnel from like initial yeah. interest in a category to actually making a purchase decision? Do you help your clients with? Yeah. For some of our larger customers, there's definitely a bit of a, a solution on top of like a solutions architect on top of the, software that they'd, they'd be buying from us. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are there are definitely some consultative elements of that. Um, you know, in, in a sense, if you're driving a bunch of traffic to a page, but that page isn't converted, yeah. then we give insights as to yeah, why that might yeah. be or how you could go about fixing that. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, for, for all of the SMBs, medium-sized companies and agencies that use our tool, it is pretty self-service. Um, and, and yeah, you can just use it to monitor, manage, and optimize uh, a website fully from basically every element that you need to. Cool. And does Moz have other related marketing tools that they provide? I thought I saw something about like CRM tools or was I mistaken? We've got, I mean, we, they've got a couple of different tools. Um, there's nothing CRM based, but there is like Moz Local, which deals specifically with local SEO and localized okay. marketing. Um, there's Moz Pro, which deals with kind of your whole site um, and how optimized your site, your website is from a technical standpoint. So making uh -huh. sure, again, that Google can crawl every page, that yeah. your pages are rendering correctly. Um, so, yeah, those are kind of the two major products that we have. And then we've also got a bunch of data 
API data that people buy on occasion okay. for certain projects and things like that. Neat. Um, so we're going to come back to you and your uh, sales experience and relationship building experience throughout the lecture, but I think that's helpful to have that background when we turn to you as our expert for the day. So I'm going to pull up our PowerPoint. We also have, just as a note to any viewer that potentially our mutual friend might be joining uh, the Zoom call at some point as well. We invited him, uh, but who knows if that will take place. So anyways, all right. So we're going to um, share my screen with Ian so he can see what's happening. And where'd you go, Ian? I'm right here. <laughs> I can't find you. Oh, here we go. Sorry. This is where I like to show off my abilities. Okay, so um, here we go in the slides. We're transitioning in our class right now, so you don't know this, Ian, but uh, students do, is that we've covered already the basics of marketing strategy, so kind of high level, firm management, positioning, finding your target customer, um, looking for points of difference against the competitors, and brand management as well. And now we're transitioning to what I'm calling managing your customers, so individual customers over time as assets. So um, not just a collection of customers that you serve as a firm, but uh, each individual customer or cohort of customers um, overall. And then towards the end of the class, we'll go towards innovation. But you're going to help us kick off, cool. kick us off with customer-based value. So just again, more kind of context. Um, what we've covered so far in class is we talked about optimal distinctiveness related to finding the right segment for you. So both um, all humans have these competing needs to be unique and to feel like an individual, uh, but also to feel like they belong and feel the safety and security of being a part of something. And so segmentation fits with that theory in that you can create this uh, target customer group where they can kind of all be somewhat similar, but also different from others. And you can align yourself and everything you do to them. So we talked about like Dollar, Dollar Save Club doing that to Gillette. Um, we talked about just kind of basics of overall finding a, a target market and aligning um, your business with Peloton. We've talked about customer equity and always trying to put your core customers first and then worrying about things like your brand and lastly your product. So an example there was the iPhone SE, which they've just announced the new version of the iPhone SE. But when they first came out with the cheaper iPhone, there was just some worry that it was going to dilute the brand because and also like take away some of the shine and the the prestige that you would get from having an iPhone when it was kind of cool to have an iPhone. Um, because all of a sudden, you know, the type of person who had an iPhone might expand to like some, you know, snotty teenager or someone who like hasn't really achieved as much as me in life or something. So I'd be like, oh, I don't, I don't want this. But what happened in Apple's business that, turns out, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what happened in Apple's business at the time that made it still good for their best customers is uh, they started investing in things like the Apple chat function and Apple Pay and Apple Music, all these different services where it would actually be a better experience for your best customers if more other people also had an iPhone were also on the iOS. So that change in circumstances made it so they could come out with cheaper versions of their phone and still um, provide a, a better experience for their best customers. Um, then we talked about the marketing strategy planning process with Blockbuster and how they lost their way and especially around or lack thereof. Yeah. Uh, well, they just weren't focused enough on aspects of convenience. That was like their core benefit was convenient entertainment. And they thought the way to provide that was have as many retail locations as possible. Kind of like when Starbucks was on every corner, but they, um, weren't thinking about convenience around return fees because return fees was where they made all their profits. So that was an aspect of inconvenience that Netflix really exploited. And then we um, haven't got to it yet in the sequence of the class, but we're going to be talking about Cafe Coffee Day and how they have to fight off Starbucks. So they're like this huge, uh, the first main kind of cafe um, chain in India, a local company, an Indian company, and Starbucks goes into the Indian market. And so as a brand, how do you position against um, this kind of big competitor who's coming in and, and has to other places made uh, kind of the established companies like a Dunkin' Donuts seem low-end and cheap. 
Um, and so it's kind of a battle of, of branding in a competitive context. But all that's important, and brands need to think about how they position themselves and uh, kind of relate to their core customers and who their target segment is. But ultimately, if you have that in place, you have to attract, convert, and retain and grow your existing customers. So um, that's a story of change. And knowing how your customers change, knowing what they're coming to you with and how you expect them to evolve and ideally their lives get better once you become more and more a part of their their life, in your case, uh, a business's life, but also for consumers. Um, and so this is my idea of a joke. We're studying how Neil Young became Neil Old. Ooh. Good joke, huh? It's been... Time has been tough on Neil Young. Time's tough on us, uh, too, Ian. We, uh, That's true. When we get together and, and try to true. knock back some drinks, I was never good at handling that, but it's gotten worse. Uh, Ian's, yeah, no joke. Ian's got the stories on that. So to uh, kind of drive this point home, I'm going to start um, by showing a commercial that both, speaking of State Farm, our insurance companies, um, this is a State Farm commercial where they are trying to show that they see you changing over time and are going to be a part of that. I'm never getting married. Never. Guaranteed. You picked a beautiful ring. Thank you. Mm. We're never having kids. Mm -mm. Ah. Hello, here. We are never moving to the suburbs. We are never getting one of those. We are never having another kid. I'm pregnant. I'm never letting go. For all the nevers in life, State Farm is there. So do you have a, a minivan yet, Ian? Not yet. Thank God. Do you? <laughs> no, just a mid-sized SUV. Um, but it's... No minivan yet. But it's, uh, and, and I'm sure as some of you are watching this, you're, you're think you're, those, some of those words might have come out of your mouth at some point. But yeah, it all does change over time very quickly. Yeah, and uh, why I like that commercial is one, it resonates a bit with uh, my life experience and in some as well. But uh, what also I like about it is um, it's a good way for the brand to say, like, we see you and also communicating to their employee base that, like, they're focused on this journey with customers and developing them. And I especially like the insurance industry for this case because they spend so much money on trying to get um, people to sign up with car insurance, right? Like, you ever watch, you know, I don't know, whatever it is, it's like uh, any sporting event, right? You see State Farm, you see Geico, you see Allstate. Like, it's like those are classic advertisers for all sporting events and TV. And what's so fascinating about that is, like, they'll spend way more money than they expect to make on car insurance from a new user in the first few years. But they'll get you with car insurance because that's usually the first insurance product someone buys. And then over time, then they'll get renter, renting insurance and maybe uh, life insurance and home insurance. Um, and life insurance, they just can make bank on that. So it's like all kind of this plan of transitioning people over time. And so they'll lose money on a new um, customer for car insurance, at least for the first couple of years, because they spend so much money just trying to get a new car insurance customer. And what I think is going to be fascinating is what happens when self-driving cars come in, into place like, and people aren't buying cars as much. You already look at like, the rate of like 16-year-olds getting licenses. Remember like, getting your license at 16? That was like the best. Yeah, that was like a huge yeah. part of my life. You know, it was all I looked forward to. And now it's not even registering. Like, people don't even care. Like, yeah, it's like they got the yeah. app. They can do the Uber. It's almost looked at as a negative now. It's like, oh, I have to go drive myself. Please. Yeah, you awful. become the DD or you got to park somewhere <clears> and <throat> get parking tickets. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think in the long run, maybe for the next 10 years, like I could see the insurance companies having to do a real big change in their planning as they built this whole business model and customer acquisition model over people getting car insurance for the first time. And now that's going to be a complete disruption or dislocation to that with self-driving cars, with Uber, with Lyft, um, with just people, you know, not owning cars to the same extent they used to. And then that trickles down to maybe impacting 
you know, the sports company. Like, how many times have you seen Chris Paul on some, you know, State Farm commercial? Like, I've always seen him tens of thousands of times. Too many times. Yeah. Too many times. Yeah. But um, so understanding uh, your customers over time in their lifespan as individual consumers or um, if it's a B2B situation, what kind of is the context that drove them to come to you is critical to understanding, okay, what's going to resonate with them? How are you going to get them to go from just kind of aware to interest to consideration and, and purchase? And so this slide here just kind of talks about the importance of mapping out the narrative that a customer comes with. And I picked Honor here as um, an example. Do you know about Honor at all, Ian? They're, yeah, they're actually a Moz customer. Okay, That's cool. Funny. Yeah, they're based in Seattle, Yeah, we Seattle, work with maybe? a number of different, uh, yeah, we work with a, a bunch of kind of long-term care facilities and um, other office type locations that are part of the Honor network. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's a good example of like how SEO matters a ton because you don't plan to need to find a long-term care facility. You get a call from, you know, some healthcare wor care worker or the police station or something and say like, hey, your parent like can't see very well anymore and just crashed their car or got arrested for driving 25 in a 75 mile per hour uh, speed zone. And so it's like all of a sudden, you know, this shock of, uh, confusion, uncertainty, potentially some grieving over loss of abilities and, and seeing your parent in a different light. You go to Google and you say, I need help. And there's all types of different keywords or whatever that could come up. But understanding the mental state, understanding the concerns, um, having this web page correct for that initial engagement um, is critical. And then Honor is a cool company in that they provide their care uh, professional caregivers all these tools like through mobile phones to help mo help you know family members monitor the um, well-being of their loved ones through like daily check-ins and and uh, diaries and um, different kind of smart technology so I've been paying attention to that company um, for a while but um, this this bottom right are you familiar with in the idea of design thinking yeah caught on. a little bit Caught on a lot uh, with Sil Silicon Valley. Um, Stanford um, has like a design school that um, is trying to think around like both starting from a place of empathy, really knowing where your customers come from. Um, yeah, and then and I think that's really big in the in the sales process as well. It's like yeah. empathy, leading with empathy is um, yeah, trying to get into your customer's head and understand what they're looking for. What are they? What do their questions really mean? Um, yeah huge net is. So what would be one of your clients? Like if you're talking to someone for, you know, the first time or whatever, what's, what's kind of their reason for engaging with you guys? I guess you guys are pretty good at SEO. I imagine yourself. Yeah. 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 Which we try to be. It's <laughs> funny though, for an SEO company, we don't do that well um, for some of it just cause it's, if everybody was able to find us, yeah. then uh, we'd have to be turning people away left and right. You but, also have good competitors um, that are also good at SEO. <laughs> like, <laughs> and there's also really good competitors. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, no, I mean, just the you talk about empathy, and it's like especially right now with mm -hmm. COVID nineteen and everything we've got going on. Like now is not a great time to be just pitching your product or selling yeah. something yeah. that your ser services that you offer. So, yeah. you know, from a, a buyer's journey perspective, and you're thinking about being empathetic to okay, what are my, you know, what is the digital marketing team of mm -hmm. State Farm going through right now? Um, how can I provide some information to them that would be generally helpful so that when they are ready to buy or yeah. when they are ready to think of an SEO company, um, my, you know, Moz comes to mind, yeah. right? So it's it's really leading with kind of something, how would you want to be treated? How, yeah. like if you knew that everything was on fire in your, yeah, your, yeah. In your marketing division, yeah. you know, you're trying to repurpose content, you're trying to re just redo a bunch of stuff, like someone reaching out to you at that point to try and sell something to you is probably not going to resonate. No, very no, well. yeah. Um, so there, there's just like, yeah, cha you know, it changes all the time. But to your to your point about kind of starting with empathy, um, yeah, I think that that covers. What do you do you know, yourself or with your team members to try to get them to kind of understand where their potential new customers are coming from, like the headspace they're coming from, or um, both like their level of knowledge and their level of interest in what you have to provide. Yeah. 
I mean, we've got, you know, in terms of like where people are, are searching from or what people are searching for, like that's part of what Moz does. We have tools that can help tell you the number of people that are searching for any s certain set of keywords yeah. um, over the last 30 days or something like that. Um, so, th you know, there are tools out there that can straight up tell you here are, you know, here are what people are searching yeah. for. Um, they're not lying to Google. Know. Yeah, they're not. They don't lie to their search engine. Yeah. So Google Keyword Planner is your friend to see kind of what people are searching for. Google Trends, like mm -hmm. that's that's a great place to identify kind of the changes in in that type of stuff. Um, you said you guys, yeah, it, focus on SMB to larger clients. So you're thinking of you know having a, a few people, a small team to a big team of digital marketing uh, employees or. Uh, specialists at your customer firm um how much do you like go to trade shows and try to interact with those people um kind of yeah a lot i mean it's it's important to go to industry events um and just be around the types of folks that are interested in the same stuff that you are yeah. um, some great connections have happened that way for sure and it's just again it's a place to just uh, meet someone, show kind of the person on the other end of the phone or the other end of the email, yeah. show that you're a real person, <laughs> show that you kind of have a, you know, have a, have a life outside of whatever job you're doing. Um, I think kind of that, that authenticity that you're able to bring to yeah. the table through a live event or some type of, you know, uh, conference or thing like that is vitally important yeah. in the relationship building process for sure. Do you like spy on people on LinkedIn to kind of get a sense of their career arc and maybe have a sense of like what they're, um, experience level is and what their maybe goals are. Or is it more just on a yeah. person to person connection? Like, do we vibe as like, yeah. Um, yeah, a little bit of both. I mean, you're, you know, if you're ever going to an event, you want to do your research beforehand. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn is, you know, for anybody listening, that's not fully grasping yeah. everything that LinkedIn can offer. Like I would, I would highly, highly recommend that you, um, go down that path. 30 free days of their, whatever service it is. Premium service. Yeah. Yeah. Sales Navigator, yeah. you know, if that that's definitely something that I use every day. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's important to just know who you're going to be meeting, know know some background, um, who else might be at the event, what companies they work for, what those companies do, just so you can have relevant conversations. Like, it's yeah. not being fake or being kind of cheesy. It's like you just want to actually be knowledgeable so that you can have enjoyable <laughs> conversations yeah. with people. Yeah, um, and that's one of your skill sets. I'd say you're always good in a uh, environment um yeah so i like thinking like what's the narrative going on in their head what is the story they're telling themselves are they saying they're doing this job because it's like a part of their larger ambition or is it like a fallback plan or whatever i think whatever you can do to try to understand the story that they're putting themselves into then you can define the problem set in their words so if you know like what how they would define the problem set then you can kind of help think of the solutions or potential solutions that would solve it. Um, so this is kind of the basic five-step path of design thinking. And it, it starts with empathy and, and really just put it in, in their words. I had someone email me just um, two days ago, a former student saying like, hey, I'm supposed to be doing digital marketing to target like 65-year-olds who are just retired to get like a membership at this. It's like a golf club in Central Oregon. He's like, what do you think I should do? I said, oh, Facebook ads. Yeah, I, well, that he's yeah. That's what it'll it'll end up being. I was like, how about you go talk to some of them? <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm not in that headspace. Uh, yeah. But just yeah, call some up. Um, you can't necessarily uh, get to see them in person right now, but. Um, yeah, and for like, and for B two B, right? Yeah. It's like if you're selling into an organization, like you want to know who that person reports to yeah, what boss. what is the reason that they want this product yes. like what issues does it solve yes. how does it make them look like an all-star how yes. does it get them promoted yeah exactly um, those are going to be those are going to be the most likely steps that get you to you know get them to buy off on your solution and if you can help them get promoted or or get a win with their own boss or at their own company then they're going to love you um it makes sense yep. so what have you found here's a question what do you find in terms of dealing with your clients and versus dealing with your friends and uh, from like even romantic relationships, like what's the similarities and differences um, that you've? Well, I can tell you, there's a lot more people involved. <laughs> yeah. In uh, in B two B sales. In B two B sales, 
than uh, than in my relationship. That's for sure. <laughs> um, but oh, that's a, these are good questions. So there's some similarities, right? Like mm -hmm. the empathy is important. You know, being able to kind of put yourself in someone else's shoes is always going to be always going to be important. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think, man? There's a lot. There's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of things that need to be slightly different as well. Um, yeah, I don't. I'm always thinking about that in terms of like the research uh, that I do. And so, like one thing is like um, we get it right in personal relationships, but then you see people get it wrong or companies get it wrong. So one example is like just the right thing at the wrong time. So if you think like you show up to a first date with a flower or something. Okay. That's, that's fine. But if you showed up with like some fancy jewelry, they'd think you're like some creep that's trying too hard. That's like trying to like come on too strong. Or really, really well. Yeah. <laughs> but still it's like, are you trying to like, you know, but you're still, what are you, well, what are you trying to do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you, you know, it's, if it's the 10 year anniversary and you show up with just the rose, it's kind of like, ah, oh, I'm underwhelmed. But then you show up with the jewelry. It's like, Oh, how sweet. Like, you better got that from Tiffany's or whatever. Um, timing is everything. Yeah, so timing. Like, I, one example is I buy something from a website, and before it even arrives at my house, right, they're asking me to recommend it to a friend. It's like, hold up, I haven't even, you know, tried you yet. I'm not gonna recommend you to a friend. Um, just too forward, too aggressive, like in terms of the staging of everything. Um, but B2B sales, like, I think one thing I was talking about with the PhD student the other day was. Um, we want our salespeople or our relationship contact points to kind of be experts to kind of help us be successful. But sometimes with our friends or siblings or family or romantic partners, we want to go through things together. We don't want them to like be the expert in the lead and like you feel like you're being dragged along like a little kid or something. So we might do some research on that. It's even like uh, watching a Netflix show, like, do you want to watch something that they've seen before? Like that, how does that, why does that drive people crazy? But it's like, no, it's not even watch it. You already watched the first episode. Like, let's watch a different show. Um, that is interesting to think about. Yeah. Cause there are, you know, for those personal relationships, it does feel a little bit better to be going through something together yeah. and you're not like a novice. One person's not the expert kind of showing you the ropes. Yeah. Um, like on a, a restaurant yeah, in a B2B or... environment, it's like, whatever you can do to leverage case studies, personal yeah. experience, other similar clients that you've helped. Like, yeah, that's basically everything. Yeah, that's a, a good point. I think um, I have a lot of that on innovation, but finding those people who can provide a testimonial. I think actually, if we go back to the last slide, like testimonial, 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 like they're highlighting these testimonials on the first page because we're looking for someone that's relatable who's had success. Um, what about, so how many people are involved with your typical clients? Like who are, or just like a, you know, if you're going to have, uh, like a, you're meeting with someone like, um, you're going to go to a site or you're going to set up a big zoom call or whatever. Like how many people are going to be involved in that? Yeah. I mean, just kind of like you mentioned, it depends on what stage in the process we're at. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, if it's really early on, there might only be one or two people on the line that might be the end user and you know maybe the the manager of the group or something like that so those would be like in the marketing um, team probably yeah yeah exactly and then um, but that that's just kind of the, maybe the number of people that i'm speaking with right yeah. the number of people that are actually involved you know it's probably double or triple that um, yeah because just there's... based on other levels yeah. of approval that need yeah. to be had legal review finance yeah. review um, technical review, if there's any of that, like to actually, you know, get the engineers and developers that yeah. need to be doing some of the implementation work, like getting them involved. So there's, you know, it could be two to three, you know, on the, you know, earlier on in the process, mm -hmm. but that usually grows to eight or nine, 10 people sometimes, and how often, maybe more than that, depending on the size. How often do you yeah. feel like you have someone on your side with, who's like the end user, but you just get things get shut down, like at some level of approval or. Yeah. No, it, it happens more than I'd like to admit. Yeah. Um, and it just is part of the reason why definitely on my team and throughout our org, like we're really trying to um, just like create alignment is kind of what we, how we talk about it. Just creating alignment between our team and whoever the equivalent yeah. should be on, on that, on that other side. Um, and that's, you know, even getting folks like our CEO involved mm. to connect with their CEO. Like there's just, mm. um, 
if you build those connections, yeah. you can um, you can limit a lot of the um, kind of gatekeeping from happening. I've, I've come to find. Yeah, that's interesting. That that's also another research idea I had at one point, but we didn't <laughs> follow up on it. Was um, trying to like status match different people. So if you had like yeah. a, a a CEO of a small company, do you bring in like your CEO, or is that like too much? It's like would it be better bringing someone who's like at an equivalent kind of level in terms of like salary and lifestyle and stuff like that. Um, but that's interesting how. Totally. Um, yes. Yeah, and it's again, kind of trying to um, get everyone connected so that if there is, so let's say one, you know, your main contact leads the company, mm -hmm. which has definitely happened to me before. Right. Yeah. So it's like trying to, you know, ensure that continuity is there even if your champion mm -hmm. leaves or if the main person that you're in contact with is you know wins the lottery or something yeah yeah uh, or gets hit by a bus uh so i like to say i always like the lottery yeah. analogy <laughs> yeah That's... i got going dark with it uh my advisor at the university of washington had a research paper that uh was very successful on customer loyalty to whom because there'd be in these b2b settings you'd have great loyalty scores but who filled out the survey? Well, it's your primary contact. And then your primary contact leaves and the loyalty at that customer firm wasn't actually to your firm. It was that person's loyalty to you as an individual. Um, <laughs> or the other thing happens is they love you and you leave and you get you go to a competitor, like you go to HubSpot or whatever, and now all of a sudden Moz is you know, scared that they're going to yeah. lose their clients because they liked working with Ian, not so much with Moz. But... Totally happens. There's a reason people assign non competes yeah. and things like that. Yeah, it's definitely legit. Um, so yeah, building those relationships is important. And if you prove that you can do good work for somebody, like it's just obvious yeah. they want to they want to continue doing that work with you, right? So if I have students who are you know 22 years old and um, have some you know knowledge around sales and and customer service and stuff in B two C settings, and they want to apply to a B two B company, like what was your journey like switching from kind of not really have any yeah. in the B2B world to starting to figure out all these things like that you need to bring in CFOs or deal with legal and how to deal with people who are have backgrounds and yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's definitely a learning curve. Right. But I started, you know, as kind of a, almost like an SDR type of a role mm -hmm. where, you know, you're learning how to talk to these companies learning what types of information they're, they're finding relevant. Um, you know, learning strategies on just how to communicate with, with the target audience. Um, and then I transitioned that type of a role into an account executive yeah. type of a role where there's kind of a little bit less of the, um, you know, outbound sales efforts, but like that was, that was the best learning experience yeah. and best method for me to feel like I could be successful in a, in a B2B conversation. Yeah. Um, I would also recommend like, there's a ton of good content and, and, there's a ton of good people out there that are making content about yeah. like how to do that, um, how to make a transition to B2B sales or how to, how to succeed there. Um, so yeah, I can definitely throw you some links, Sweet. but um, there, there would be, you know, I would, I would kind of, uh, you know, urge everybody to learn how to learn and who to learn yeah. from. Like there are some really smart um, people in, in even specific industries. Like it can get really niche with like, yes, the B2B guy in yes. FinTech startups yeah. in San Francisco, like or aerospace there are, you know, or, yeah. There. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so there's, yeah, there are niche wealth, wealths of information yeah. on, on basically every topic you can imagine out there. It just takes a little bit of effort to go find them. Related to that. I think a lot of my students end up working in B2B sales, oftentimes through some SDR role, um, just kind yeah. of starting out and, uh, they think they're going to hate it, but then after they kind of get to your level, they like it a lot. Can you talk about how like, the yeah. intellectual challenge is more than just like, um, you know, uh, kind of the used car salesperson, like, you know, product knowledge, customer knowledge, um, and just kind of. Yeah. Every game I think, and I think that's, that's exactly it. Right. Is like, you have to stop thinking about it from a used car salesperson yeah. mentality and start thinking about it from how you're actually helping these people. People want interaction. People want to talk to somebody a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, Especially now. You don't have to be a shitty salesperson. You yeah. can be a good salesperson. Yeah. Like they're, they do exist out there. Um, and especially from an SDR perspective, it's like, you know, no need to put labels on things, right? Like if you can, I, I would, I would highly recommend you get a good job at a good company, any type, you know, SDR, whatever yeah. the 
janitor, whatever. It's like, if you can find the right organization that you want to be a part of yeah. and work your way through that, like, I think there's, there's a lot, um, a lot that could be gained from, from kind of going that path. If you find the right company, yeah. um, finding the right company, the right technology, the right, you know, the right tools I think is, is huge. Um, but yeah, sorry. I kind of went off on a tangent. No, no, what were you about? I just wanted your, yeah, your personal perspective on, cause you went from, uh, what was your degree in uh, at Carroll? I was an I was an accounting major, yeah, so right. I majored in accounting. Like I I did an internship where I was doing you know audits. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's like, and that was you know not for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just ended up totally just not even using my you know obviously some some yeah. things of my accounting degree are your base relevant, knowledge but... was a little bit higher that might yeah. be helpful for exactly. You know. I have a, a base knowledge, but no, I mean, it was, um, yeah, kind of going down the path of um, getting on, you know, sales is going to be in pretty much every profession yeah. that you look towards yeah. in some degree or another. Um, and, it, and so, yeah, just coming at it from the mindset of you're actually helping people yeah. um, and, you know, that people want knowledgeable experts to talk to about this stuff on the phone. Um, and you can grow that into something awesome. Uh, and I've seen a lot of people do it, um, whether it's, starting as an SDR or starting, you know, in, you could start as an account executive or whatever, yeah. in some type of sales capacity, but you're just going to learn, learn and learn and learn. And once you're, you know, once you're there and once you're kind of in the seat producing and kind of getting the feel for things, you'll understand pretty quickly if it's something that you enjoy. Yeah. Like I enjoyed the shit out of like closing deals and <laughs> yeah. winning business yeah. and like being able to do that um, all with the, the frame of reference of being empathetic and helping people. Yeah. But you know, that, that was just kind of where, where I was coming at it from. Yeah. It's nice with your business that if you're successful, you're helping, uh, other companies be successful, getting new clients. And, and so it's like a, the winds trickle down to the end user. Yeah. Um, and I think you absolutely. And if you can, yeah. Yeah, well, just you being ahead. in Seattle and liking technology and liking digital marketing, it was nice that uh, Moz was there for that's, you. That's exactly right. Just like find find something that you like and that you're interested yeah. in. Like that'll that will keep you motivated when you're like not getting the wins. You know, when you're when you're dealing with rejection. Yeah, getting or, the L's. Yeah, when you're when you're in the middle of it. Yeah, because it will happen. Yeah. But like find so find something that you really enjoy or so along that those you lines, think the technology is really cool. Why did you uh, jump from Amazon to Moz? It's, if you can briefly kind of share that. Yeah. No, I mean, that was uh, my, I had been at Moz for um, a little over four years, or sorry, Amazon. Your stock so options had for, vested. <laughs> yeah, so that was, that was nice, you know, I had that going for me, but um, I was also looking, the the product that I was working on at Amazon, um, we were helping national companies mm -hmm. um, for, within this Amazon local product, so it's kind of like the daily deal of, mm. of Amazon, Yeah, back uh, and when... we were looking at what was that yeah, company? Yeah, similar to Groupon. Yeah, Groupon, Groupon was the, the thing, very, yeah. Very yeah. Right. Um, and we were looking for other ways to really help uh, the advertisers that we were working with mm. beyond just the daily deal. One of the things that we found was localized SEO. Mm. So um, that was basically the thought that, you know, if I'm doing a deal with Starbucks yeah. and for a buy one, get one free at every Starbucks around the country, you need to be able to go to your mobile phone and immediately find where that Starbucks yeah. is. If you go to your mobile phone and search for Starbucks yeah. or coffee or whatever, and yeah. the wrong location information shows up, a bad address, a it's bad phone, number, a bad menu. It's infuriating, yeah. number one, and you lose that customer, you burn yeah. their trust. Yeah. Like it's it's one of the worst things you could do from a brand perspective. Um, is, is And I don't know if you've ever like showed up to a place closed that there. says it's there on Google Maps, yeah. but it's like a closed business or something that's no yeah. longer in existence. Um, that is, obviously yeah. tremendously damaging to yeah. a brand like I, I don't know how you stack that up in terms of bad <laughs> things that could happen to to your kind of brand perception but that that to me is really high like if that ever happened to me i'm just yeah. like all right i'm done with this for <laughs> forever um yeah. but yeah so that makes sense because you saw it at amazon it's actually amazing how big a player and so, amazon so, has sorry, gotten to, to kind of finish that yeah. off it's like i saw that at amazon or, you know saw that as something that we should be doing we could be doing for these mm -hmm. these large brands to help them get more out of this daily deal than just um the one-time offer yeah. type thing we'd actually give them the ability to manage their location data and ensure that it shows up correctly and some stuff like that yeah. 
Um, and that's what Moz currently helps a lot of customers with cool. today. And so that's how I found out about Moz, had a friend that was working there mm. um, and the timing just worked out. They were just starting up their kind of enterprise sales team and that's pretty nice. much what I wanted to do at that time. Sweet, thanks for sharing that background. Yeah. Um, I was just gonna comment that it's amazing how far Amazon's come as an advertising company. Like, yeah. The search Insane. ads now, if you search for anything on Amazon, like it's just like Google search as their Google search ads. Amazon's doing that. They're also using their yeah, they Fire do. TV to do ads um, and Alexa and that maybe will be placing ads. All their, uh, all their owned and operated properties. So yeah. you know, like diapers.com. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they've, you've, they've got an ad network. They've got. They're a beast. Um, yeah, they they're they're doing it. They're doing it big time. And it's cool that it's kind of a good example of how they see something as potential and then kind of keep iterating and figuring out how to do it right because you were there more early days and they were just trying to spin up the advertising. Um Yeah. All right, so that was uh helpful. All right, this is just some general advice that I have related to customer relationship building. Um and one of them is that you never want to come in with a discount or you want, you don't want to win business with a discount. Um, because later on, as you try to increase your, uh, oh, I'm getting some feedback on the, the vocals, but, uh, later on, as you try to add more services or increase your value, you will always be seen as that discount provider. So this is my hilarious image to capture that. <laughs> You're stone cold on me. <laughs> You there? No laugh, no smile, nothing? I don't know, I lost audio for a second. Oh, okay. I was, yeah, what, do you, what do you think of this image? Can I get a smile? All right, we're back from a uh, audio mishap and I tried to make Ian laugh and it didn't work, so not the first time. Um, no. We're moving on. We're gonna talk about the relationship toolkit. So these are different services that are usually provided by external companies that specialize in it, Moz would be one, and they help um, companies be good at managing their own customer relationships. So the first category would be CRM. CRM stands for Customer Relationship Management, and it usually involves both um, databases and also different applications that run on top of them. So. It's around storing transactional and personal information about your clients and your customers, and then providing easy access to that information at the right point in time. And it can power things like a loyalty program, it can power things like personalized emails, personalized website experiences. So you basically just want to have more knowledgeable interactions across each customer touch point. Um, a customer touch point is any way in which a customer will experience your brand through a salesperson, through a service person, through uh, a Twitter, through um, digital media, uh, any branded um, uh, experience. So also just using your product and services. Those are all be places where your customer comes in contact with you and your representatives. Um, the data that is stored in a CRM helps power predictive models, which we're going to uh, cover in this class, such as choice models to um, predict which customers are at the greatest risk of defecting, of quitting, of no longer using your service. And if you know that, then you can start trying to do some interventions. So I could say like, all right, these are 50 customers who are um, likely to defect in the next month. Here's another 50 customers. And we're going to implement some a creative idea to try to keep them from defecting. We'll only do it with group A and then see if the change in defection is different across those two groups. Um, so like uh, Netflix has actually worked with some University of Oregon professors. Uh, some of my students have taken Troy's class, and he talks to them about different content that would be um, best to provide different customers who might be at risk of defecting after they get done with a certain show, for example. Loyalty programs are typically reactive, and they're structure and rule-based, and they reward past behavior. And for those reasons, they're bad but they do allow customers, or they usually incentivize customers to let you track them. And so you can see what they're doing in terms of their purchases, their transactions. And so they feed your CRM system. But they're very dangerous. I've done research on large programs because they're another area to compete, but also another area of your business to screw up. 
and and when companies try to implement a loyalty program and it goes wrong, it infuriates customers because they feel like it's unfair. They think that they've earned it, so they feel entitled to all the benefits. Um, so they're part of the, the toolkit, but um, not always, uh, you know, they're almost more defensive to some extent. Engagement initiatives are more offensive, they're more proactive. They're risky, they need to be targeted well and that they can break habits, they can make a company look desperate or manipulative. But what's nice about them is with a good CRM system, maybe you already have a loyalty program, on top of it you can be proactive and you can kind of look for ways to delight and solidify um, business with existing customers. So an example of that would be if Alaska Airlines has uh, Ian as a business client, he flies around to different conferences, occasionally goes to meet with clients, um, and they know that he's using his miles to go on a trip to Hawaii, um, and he's booked a flight with two or three or four people, maybe two of them are children under five. They could show up at the gate and meet him with like a, a kit of things to um, make the, the trip more enjoyable. Um, and so that's giving him some status and some prestige at a moment where it would actually resonate because... If he's got like a little kid who misses his dad when he travels, and it's like, oh, you know, dad travels and it uh, allows us to have nice things. So that would be um, kind of a, a good thing. One thing I'm missing here is SEO. So uh, why don't you add to that, like how search engine optimization mm -hmm. and both paid and organic fits in with the, the relationship toolkit? Yeah, I mean, it's just another just super effective piece that you need in any, you know, marketing company, really. I mean, it's um, SEO is just the, you know, the process by which you're organizing the content on your site and optimizing everything, your digital brand, so that search engines can find you so that customers can find you um, and that they get a consistent, you know, accurate, informative message when they find you. Um, that's just another piece to kind of building the the overall relationship with the customer. Um, yeah. So if you create uh, relevant content that you put out on the internet that is going to help um, kind of inform a customer who's coming to the space with a problem for the first time, or they've realized their current provider is just not doing well enough, then you can come across as credible. And um, oftentimes that can be the first point, the first touch point for your customer that you can observe. So if you do some big paid media, some big even Facebook ads that might be influential to them, but they don't click on the link, um, then they can't see that you show any interest. So um, if yeah, and it's, yeah, how do you convert like a first time visitor to a website to what that company might consider a qualified lead? Um, yeah, I mean, well, it's, it really comes down to having different parts of that funnel, right? It's like so you're making different content for getting people into that very top of the funnel. Mm -hmm different content for kind of working them through the funnel, giving them more kind of pointed information about maybe things that they've been researching on your site, webinars that they've attended. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, working it down to the bottom of the funnel where you're, you know, really looking to, to provide them with a, a call to action or something to make them transact with you. So, but it's super important, just like you mentioned, yeah. to, to have questions that answer each parts of that funnel and each yeah. part of that content. I don't know where, how much you've talked about kind of the, the marketing funnel on your Yeah, a little uh, bit. Um, class, but, we talked about a little bit yeah. with like building a brand and how you start with awareness to interest, consideration, trial, um, purchase, retention. Yeah, and in B2B, it's just mapping kind of the buyer's journey yeah. to each of those stages, right? So you're yeah. really just trying to figure out, okay, if I'm a buyer of your product and I'm really early on in the decision-making process, yes. what types of questions am I asking? What type of searches am I doing? Yes. Um, okay, now that I know what those are, how do I make good, compelling, informational content around that that will actually answer the question that you're asking into the search bar from you know on the as the top result? It's like if you create yeah. good content that does all of that and is really well structured and optimized, like that's how you can be on the top of the search results yeah. at each of those different phases of the And funnel. if you do yeah. it poorly, then you maybe you just show some like end solution for an expert user and then someone encounters it excited and they get disillusioned because you've kind of shown them too much of the benefits and not walked them through the journey at the right pace. Yeah. Um, exactly. There's a researcher, last name Billiter, who did some kind of neat research on the different kind of stages customers go through from like this kind of 
They underestimate how hard it will be to become good at something such as using SEO uh, right away. And then so they end up becoming disillusioned. But then at that point, they underestimate how fast they're going to improve at it as well. So there's like this point that's really yeah. an abandoning point, usually around like a 30 day free trial. It's like, oh, it'll be easy because yeah. the salesperson or the kind of flow of information over promises the benefits and makes it seem simple because they want to keep someone kind of moving down towards purchase. But then because it's promised to be so easy, they experience some pain or some difficulty or some uh, user interference. And then you see a lot of kind of churn at that point. Um, but if they, yeah. And I mean, you yeah. mentioned, you mentioned the 30 day free trial, like mm -hmm. that is exactly what Moz has. And we have teams of people working on yeah. how to improve that vesting rate, yeah. how to, you know, improve the churn rate, like the number of people that are, yeah. Uh, Do they call them signing up for a free trial? And how yeah. often are they? Yeah, are they called customer success uh, representatives? Or? Well, we there's a we do have a customer success team, nice. but they're actually um, the the folks that interact with a lot of the free 30 day trialers is our onboarding team. Okay, yeah. So that was one of the things that we instituted because we found that yeah, if you give somebody a free 30 day trial and then don't give them a bunch of different avenues within which they can use the tool set, be trained on the tool set, and uh, get value out of the tool yeah. set. It, it's really often that they will not continue forward paying. It's especially difficult when you are trying to onboard a whole team of users who might be interested in different aspects of your your toolkit that you provide them, your product. Um, For sure. I think that's one place where, again, I see a lot of my students getting their first jobs is on those onboarding teams, on those customer success teams where they learn about their product, they learn about their clients a bit, and they try to help them use it successfully early on so that there's not that abandonment in the first uh, implementation. Video game companies are really good at studying the kind of like journey that users go on because they always want to provide like a challenge that's a little bit further than where someone is, but not so hard they can't kind of get over the hump or whatever. Because like we like some resistance, then we like these breakthroughs. And so like the psychology of learning is really important. Don't casinos do that too? Uh, I don't know. I, I try to stay away from casinos, especially when I'm with you. Uh, that's probably for, probably for the best. <laughs> New Orleans, I think, was the one time uh, it went well for me. But um, Okay, so these are some emotions to pay a lot of attention to, and sometimes they get confused when it comes to relationship selling. So envy can actually be good, where jealousy is usually bad. So envy is wanting something that someone else has, and benign envy is where you aspire to attain it, where malicious envy is where you get shot in Florida and happiness when they experience a loss. Um, so showing that you treat some customers really well because you've invested in their relationship and there's this nice kind of sequence that it goes through, that's good for benign envy and creating aspiration. Comcast does it the opposite, where they give a brand new customer who has, hasn't even been there all these nice deals, like free HBO for you know a year, and then after you've been their customer for a while, they're like, all right, now you don't get free HBO anymore. And oh, by the way, we tripled the price for you. And like, you're like, what the hell? Like, that's, you know, messed up. So that just pisses you off. Um, jealousy is, is separate. It's where you feel that another is causing a threat to you in terms of a loss of something you want. So you don't want to cultivate any jealousy in terms of like treating one customer with more attention than another in a way that feels like that's going to uh, undermine the, the kind of ignored customer's ability to um, get the full value out of whatever you're providing. So those are underrated emotions to think about, especially in settings where consumers um, consume together. So like you're all observing each other getting treated at different levels. Airlines is the classic example. There's a cool study. Uh, this guy um, out of Boston did um, where he basically worked with, I forget the airline that um, it was like JetBlue or something like that, but they had different sets of planes where one, the first class entered and everyone else entered in the same door and they all walked past first class and back to coach versus another plane they designed it where the entrance was right after first class. And so people who entered there, the first class would turn to the left and the people staying in kind of normal coach would turn to the right and they're able to see that in the airplanes and it's kind of like randomly assigned or you wouldn't expect it to be determined by customers in airplanes where they boarded and had to walk past first class 
it was a higher incident of like onboard incidents, whatever they, they track, right? Customers getting upset, throwing fits, just like whatever, versus when they entered and kind of went their separate ways, which is kind of more, I think, you know, cultivating these kind of malicious versus benign envy, um, where you walk past the people in first class and it's like, ah, screw these people. Um, especially it's like there's, but does it create enough of that benign envy to make passengers want to ride first class? Yeah. So they, they've done the math, the business has done the math in their head and they're okay with the number of, uh, conflicts they have on their planes. Well, yeah, it's cool. Cause it's like this product design choice that seems not important. Like where you put the entrance to the airplane for the passengers actually has yeah. these huge implications for that. the experience on board. Um, so yeah, envy is you want to cultivate aspiration, but not um, any sense of unfairness. Unfairness is really the poison. You can be disappointed by a business. You can feel like they um, screwed up or dropped the ball or whatever. But if they didn't, if they did it in a way that was fair, if they did it in an understandable way, if you can kind of attribute it to an accident or a learning mistake, um, you'll stick with them. And actually, you might increase your trust because you've seen, okay, they did something wrong, but they didn't like take advantage of me or they didn't uh, try to just diminish it. They owned it. So actually it's almost like, Showing some transparency. yeah, if you were um, kind of deviant about it, you can almost like plan for these moments where you screw up just so that you could come in with like this good way of apologizing and owning yeah. it. it. Makes you look more human, yeah. more, uh, more likable, more. Um, yeah. If you think about friends, like you might have a friend who every experience with is good, but you don't know if they'll be there for you, like if shit really hits the fan versus another friend, like, you know, maybe you don't get along with them as well. Maybe your, your interests have kind of diverged over time, but you've been through some real shit together. So, you know, they got your back. Um, it's kind of an opportunity sometimes to, to show you'll stick with them. Another factor in this is, is how do your customers uh, relate to each other? So the relationships among your customers. Um, so I don't know if you guys have this or what your policies are, but do you serve, uh, client firms who compete against each other? Like a uh, state farm in all state or like we would, mm -hmm. um, but they actually have language in their contracts most of the mm -hmm. time that forbid us from working with a certain list of named customers mm. um that's usually part of the legal process and something that we try and limit yeah. if ever possible but yeah. um yeah it's definitely definitely happened because oftentimes if you have a win with a, a customer in a similar industry or similar category that is motivating for their competitors to want to join you as well right so it's like you can use success with one customer to win some clients who would compete with them because they want to experience the same success um Again, very much so, yeah. but you, you have to, it's, it's kind of an interesting, interesting game, right? Cause you don't want to piss off your one really good yeah, client, yeah. right? That, that all your customers yeah. now, you, you work with them. Um, but you do want the, the best way to do it is really to just get agreed upon case studies or yeah. the, you know, agreed upon ability to use a brand's name yeah. in your conversations. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's a good way. Um, another thing to think about is 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 there some repulsion amongst your customers in their relationship so in this case this lady is having a terrible user experience because they have a hot sweaty bus where the kind of way to hold on is above your head if they had a different design choice or just air conditioning or whatever um it would be a better user experience for everyone involved so just thinking about um those is important the next kind of research study i want to touch on um is related to gratitude so oftentimes um, companies will do things trying to elicit gratitude because they expect that gratitude will convert into more loyalty, higher sales, lots of different benefits. And this study shows that it's, it's very important. So you just do some relationship marketing investment that will translate into trust and commitment and also feelings of gratitude. But this linkage from relationship marketing to feelings of gratitude is contingent on four factors being a part of it. So it needs to seem like it's done out of free will with benevolent motives. So you can't seem like you're doing it with some ulterior motives to try to control or manipulate. You can't seem like it can't be done out of some policy. Um, like loyalty programs are not very good at eliciting gratitude. They're really good at making customers feel entitled because I've shopped at this ice cream shop 10 times. I deserve my 11th free ice cream or whatever it is. Um, 
it helps if it seems like it's at some risk to the provider and then of course the perceived value um, should be high. So if those four things are in place, then any relationship marketing effort can convert to lots of gratitude and that gratitude can have a big return on investment. Um, so we see that uh, we have this natural desire to feel gratitude and elicit gratitude and that converts um, with trust and, and reciprocity. If you don't feel gratitude, you might be a psychopath. Are you a grateful person, Ian? I think you are. Very. Yeah, I'm grateful every day. <laughs> uh, it's reinforced by positives to um, kind of repay something you feel grateful for. You get pleasure out of that. And also negatives. If you don't repay after you felt grateful, you feel some guilt. And so there's been lots of experiments um, just documenting the return on investment from efforts to make someone feel grat gratitude. So it kind of gets back to your point in that to be a good salesperson, you actually have to deliver value, right? And you have to want to, you have to seem genuinely interested in helping your clients. Like you should like your clients and then that will elicit the gratitude. But if you are just trying to like get a quick win, some commission or whatever, um, you actually will be a worse salesperson in the long run because you won't. And that might, might benefit you one time, yeah. but it will not benefit you in the future because that person's never going to want to work with you again. Yeah. And like digital marketing, especially is a smallish industry. Yeah. And like, I can tell you how many times I've come across people working in other roles yeah. or saying, Hey, I used to work with you at, at Moz. Yeah. I moved over to this company and now I'm in charge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. I was low person on the totem pole and now I'm kind of, uh, a big yeah. influential we, decision we maker. Need something to help manage our SEO. Yeah. So great. Also, uh, and, Tons of times I've had uh, former students tell me that they switched jobs because one of their clients hired them. So yeah, again, you know. it's like it goes to show doing good work yeah. and you know providing value um, that will be a net benefit yeah. <laughs> you know to your career to everything you want to do. Yeah, one of my friends who actually is an accountant worked at KPMG for a while. Um, worked <laughs> on the Washington Huskies account and. Uh, always wanted to work in sports and eventually got a job offer from the the Huskies to be part of their financial team for the athletic department, but didn't take it because it would have been a huge pay cut. But I thought like, wow, I'm like relatively pretty young and I could have got to this level through being an accountant and just doing good work with them than I ever could have gone just trying to go in the front door and just trying to be in... Um, like go into the UW finance. Yeah, they just team. kind of treat you like uh, crap. How, how, the whole time. It goes yeah. back to that joke I was trying to show you that drunk octopus wants to fight with the coat hanger. Uh, <laughs> it's like if someone sees you in a certain light, like you'll always be that to them. Um, but if you oh, so you're saying like it's hard to unsee that once you've seen it, right? Yeah. Here's another one. Uh, cheater's gonna cheat. I should update this one to do the one. What's the the guy looking over the shoulder? You know the. Yeah. But um. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you yeah, want to be yeah. careful of customers you steal. Like if they're up for if they're up for a new contract or they're up for anything, but um, this is based on research in B two C. So I don't know as much if it shows up in B two B, but like customers that um, you kind of steal with discounts, with temporary trials, with like um, you know when they're not kind of looking to renew, end up having really low retention rates. So you. Uh, in studies mm -hmm. of retention, it's kind of one aspect of, um, another thing is the bigger the prize, usually the more people spend trying to win that account. And so the account overall can sometimes be less profitable. So you have a higher cost to win. It, um, ends up not being worth it. One thing that's kind of, uh, surprising, I guess, is that if it takes a customer a longer time to make a decision, like so from being a qualified lead to actually becoming a customer, that time period is really predictive of how long that customer will last. So kind of people who are impulsive and make quick decisions will also impulsively quick decision leave you. But if they're kind of really thoughtful and, and take a long time, it might be hard to win that account. But when you do, usually they're much more loyal and longer. Um, and they know that ahead of time. So that's why they take so long kind of vetting the decision. Do you have any thoughts or reactions to that? Um, well, I was just going to say to back one more mm -hmm. slide around um, Cheaters gonna cheat. stealing customers and that whole thing. It kind of goes the other way too, in terms of like, as a seller, like if you're talking about your other customers, mm -hmm. then they know that you're willing to talk about other customers <laughs> to win deals. And it's just kind of a weird situation, right? So um, 
yeah, that's one where it, it kind of goes both ways that um, you can le like leveraging case studies and leveraging current current clients is um, definitely a good way to get you know people more comfortable. But um, you just need to be careful about kind of the that process yeah. and making sure that you know every you know the brands that you're working with feel loved. They're okay with you using them as a as a reference or as a uh, a point of continuity within a company. Yeah, sometimes. Um important clients will get way reduced rates by allowing the the firm to kind of tout that they have them as a client um yep absolutely um, huge leverage yeah case studies are you know you want to you want to hear about other people's experiences you don't want to hear about me telling you how great our yeah. products are right? yeah let your satisfied customers speak they're the best sales people um yep. all right uh types of relationship investments so well, you can classify different investments you make in your customers in a number of different ways. Um, the one that has the highest ROI is any social investments. So how do you personalize the relationship? How do you make it more than just a business transaction? This could be providing some sense of status, some perks, some access, but it can even be just getting to know someone, their birthday, their family, taking them out to dinner, making it... Um, so that they enjoy doing business with you. They might think of you maybe not as a, a full-fledged friend, but uh, um, at least someone that uh, ma makes their work more enjoyable. Um, so that's got about a $1.80 return on investment for every $1 spent. You get back $1.80 for any... So like taking people out to dinner, taking them to a sporting event, to events like that. Do you do any wining and dining in your role? On occasion, yeah, I would say it's a perk of my job um, when we get to do it, but no, it pays off, man. And it's fun to just go out to dinner with people, go to basketball games, yeah. like, you know, when sports is here, um, doing that stuff is fun to just, again, you're, you're trying to build that organic relationship and sure. We've all got a lot of friends and who needs more friends, right? But Not you. Um, it is, well, besides you, Connor, um, it's great to actually enjoy being around the people that you end up working with. Cause you're probably going to spend a lot of time with them. So. Um, no, using use and if, if your company's cool with you doing stuff like that yeah. because there is a positive ROI to yeah. it, um, I would highly recommend you take full advantage. Yeah, this same friend uh, that I was just talking about before, when KPMG was recruiting him, they took him and all the other recruits out for drinks. I was going to bring that up. I didn't know if it was this was the time or the place, but I remember Jack and. Were Dan you there was, uh, that night? Hearing for KPMG, <laughs> and I didn't even know if they were. So. Oh yeah, the guy who was uh, trying to recruit these you know accounting students to join kpmg he passed out at the bar and the bartender had his corporate credit card and so the whole entire bar got free drinks from the corporate card and the dude was just passed out and the whole bar was chanting kpmg and the dude was just that was one of the funniest memories i have from visiting you guys i wish i remembered it i had to hear about it the next day <laughs> no <laughs> think i was behaved i can't remember um yeah. the next best investment would be a structural investment so this is setting up some customized linkage like if you're integrating with a company's own software and stuff like that um anything that increases the efficiency for your customers to do business with you so i'd be like fedex installing equipment in warehouses to help nike do just-in-time delivery um, um how about the uh amazon and ups partnership deal where I can just return stuff. Yeah. Like you just take whatever you have into a UPS store and they scan your code and then you just walk out. Yeah. I was like, that was the Best one thing. that I noticed <laughs> recently that was just like, this is really nice. I'm glad they, glad whoever came up with this. Game. Yeah. And Amazon surprisingly is even doing it with a uh, Kroger. Um, I think, oh, really? or one of the, there's some, uh, no, I, damn it. I forget the name of it. It's like a Macy's type of department store. Not quite Macy's, somewhere between like... And they're, they're doing the returns for them? Yeah, and like a direct competitor of Amazon will take returns because it's yeah. good for Amazon. And it's, it's If someone goes to return company. it there, maybe they'll go just buy it at the, you know, whatever they just returned, a different size or whatever. Um, yeah. the, there's positive break e even and positive ROI, but only if interactions are frequent enough. So if it's something where you're in a repeated interaction uh, game, then these structural investments can be good for... Uh, sales return on investment, and then also they're great for uh, loyalty because they're very sticky. Um, and then financial uh, investments in your customers do not pay off typically. Now, I think 
You, before we started recording, you were talking about what you're doing with your customers around uh, coronavirus. But typically, if yeah. you're giving people special discounts, free products, loyalty rewards, um, you're not going to generate any positive return on investment. And it acquires your customers or trains them to be deal prone. So I think like uh, Pepsi and, and Coke with Walmart will go on sale like every other week. And so people who are like Coke buyers will just you know, do their shopping around when they expect it to be on a discount. Um, I forget where I heard it, but it's the, you know, your best discount is your first discount, you know, and everything else from there is like, you're just kind of training your customers yeah. to get that, right? Why don't you share though, what you're saying about um, working with customers through coronavirus? Oh yeah. Well, it's just, you know, now is really strange times and there's a lot of uh, folks that we're working with that either they're directly affected or their customers are are directly affected. So we're thinking proactively of creative ways to really help them through these times. Um, you know, developed a couple of different messages out there around like, you know, free month or, you know, we can extend your contract by X amount of days and, you know, however long you don't pay for, we can just extend your contract. So we've been we've been really trying to think of creative ways to help our customers get through this. Um, because at the end of the day, if, if a business doesn't survive yeah. this, then we don't have the customer at the end of the day. Yeah. Anyway, so. Your partners. Um, yeah, we're getting creative. Yeah, I, I like that in that it's um, being flexible, it's being partners, it's being creative, but it's not communicating that you provide less value. Like, that's the thing is like when you're asking someone to pay you a lot of money or if my students are negotiating over a job offer, like you're doing, you're thinking about the value proposition and communicating to people that you intend to provide value and that's a really important signal um, for how they see you but it also sometimes is necessary just to keep the relationship alive or in this case keep the yeah and, in, and the, on the other end of it too it's like the more that we do now mm -hmm. hopefully that breeds more loyalty to our platform and yeah. you know five, you know a couple years from now when they're looking at services they want to cancel they're like oh we don't need to cancel us because they've been really nice to us. yeah and the other thing is um when you're in the B2B setting, you can have a customer that if if you bill them based on how much they use, if they grow, if they become more successful, then you're just going to get more revenue just because they're doing a good job. So like I think uh, Twilio, right? They had mm -hmm. like 50%, they IPO'd for like multi-billion dollars and over 50% of their revenue came from just Airbnb and Uber. So they just happened to get those two companies as clients when they were really small. And Uber and Airbnb just blew up so much that it was, uh, they like, just got great um, sales growth themselves just from two clients. So yeah, how, having good clients and helping them win um, can pay off. So another lesson is uh, related to relationships is don't imprison your customers. Um, you want to be like little Bo Peep. Uh, she lost her sheep. Someone gave her good advice. He said, leave them alone and they'll come home wagging their tails behind them. Something like that. I don't know the precise words of it. But Netflix does a great job of this. Sling TV, I think, does a great job in that you can pause, you can cancel, you can do whatever. They'll keep kind of a shadow account of you with your login and information. So if you end up returning, you still have all your recommendations. You still have everything you like. But it's really easy just to shut things down and cancel. Um, they'll give you options to pause or cancel. Blue Apron, on the other hand, they make it, or at least when I was interacting with them, made it a real pain in the ass to um, cancel. And what that does is it shuts down your likelihood to kind of re-up with them. It also decreases your likelihood to recommend them um, because you don't want to recommend to someone and then if they decide they don't like it, they're kind of suffering through uh having to kind of deal with the pain in the ass, call someone, get put on hold, et cetera, et cetera. So you kind of got to trust in yourself and trust that you got the value. And if you don't, you got to figure, you got to talk to them, talk to clients who left and figure out why they left and then think about how you can increase your value. But don't try to like sign people up and then hope they don't leave. And if they try to leave, make it hard for them to leave and hope they just give up. Um, that's kind of like desperate tactics that uh, might, work a little bit over the long term those probably aren't going to work out very well for yeah them. um net promoter score you guys keep track of that yeah for sure so um it's so commonly used in industry i think the great thing about yeah. it is, is it's just one question that can kind of give you a benchmark to track over time or track across different people um but this is it for my students um 
are you involved in hiring people and interviewing people? Yeah. Um, so one piece of advice I give my students and I'd like to hear your perspective to see if it makes sense is that in some interviews at a certain point in time, you might be talking about a problem or an idea. And I really emphasize to my students that say to always be kind of humble about the ideas. Maybe they even like the idea, but like, you know, potentially this could work, just one idea, but, and then follow up whatever it is with, and I'd want to test it to see how effective it is. And if it's something that would impact people's attitudes, you could say, I would measure the NPS or the net promoter score for the people that experienced my idea versus, you know, people in the past or other customers who didn't and see if there's a lift. And I think just that showing the process of trying to tie the loop. You need an acronym. So yeah. Or, you, you seem legit. You say I got that NPS. Yeah, totally. Um, no, but I think you're totally right. It's like bringing something like that into, you know, speaking their language and into kind of a real world example of what you could do. Yeah. It's because people use it. I mean, that's a score that yeah. everyone, everyone yeah. uses. I think it's so acronyms you smart. said today, you said SEO, you said, what was another acronym you said? I forget. But it, I said SEO a couple yeah, times. Yeah, so. there's another one too. Um, I forget. Like KPI is another one you have people talk about nice. all the time. Um, I don't know. They just they float around there all the time, and you if you can kind of use them, it's almost like there's a weird weird Al Yankovic song about like in the NBA where they just do all the buzzwords. It's kind of hilarious, but you want to yeah. selectively use the buzzwords at the appropriate moment. Otherwise, you look like a okay. moron. But um close to wrapping up here i appreciate your time ian um this is just yeah. emphasizing the importance of word of mouth you've talked a lot about uh, testimonials where you're actively like getting word of mouth out of your success uh successful clients but this is the story of ebay's growth that was all organic through word of mouth and the cool thing about this story i don't know if you know the background is they were underfunded versus another online uh, auction house and uh, like I think it was something like 10 to 1 in terms of the amount of capital that eBay had raised versus this other online auction house. But the other online auction house specialized in B2B used office equipment. So the idea would be like, we're going to upgrade our office and we have all these desks and computers yeah. and stuff. We'll auction them off and someone else will buy them. And the problem with that is no one... It worked, it was nice and everything, but no one was excited about it and there weren't repeat users. Yeah, what's the, the scalability of that? Like, how many times am I looking to buy office chairs? Yeah, so you get a customer once, they use it, it works, but they never tell anyone about it because it's not like, hey, guess what I did? I, I bought some office chairs. I outbid these guys yeah. from my uh, desk. Yeah, so my there's no, like, suite. virality to it. Um, versus eBay, was like it was like uh, collector's items, like stamps, uh, sports cards. Um like posters, conference, and so you'd win one of those, you'd want to tell everyone, and also there's already these communities online that would talk about like... Be like, hey, where'd you, I'm not like, yeah. hey, where'd you get that desk chair? Yeah, you know? exactly. So the online existing communities uh, facilitated that word of mouth, and it just took off like crazy. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about later on in the class the kind of different factors in product design and in messaging and stuff that can help improve that. Um, the problem is um, word of mouth works both ways and average businesses only hear from 4% of their dissatisfied customers. And the people who complain versus that 4% who complain versus the 96 that don't complain are actually more likely to stay. Um, and 60% of complainers would stay if their problem was resolved and 95% would stay if their problem was resolved quickly. So the question is, are companies investing enough resources in finding out who these other 96% are, finding out what their problems are and trying to address them through changes to product design, to experience, to who their salesperson is. Most companies are only focused on acquiring new customers and not so much focused on understanding what's going on with their lost customers. What do you guys do around complainers and lost customers? You guys? Yeah, it's just crazy, right? Because it's so much harder to get a new customer than keep an old customer, right? So there's in Ma, you know, we've obviously got a couple of different ways that we do this, but um, for our customers, we do have like reputation management software that can tell you how your reviews look on Google and Yelp mm. and Facebook, you know? So there are methods to identify what people are saying about your business out there. Yeah. Um, and then you can tie that back to very real business impacts, right? Um, 
forget uh, the exact story, but you know, there's there's plenty of examples out there of customers of ours mining their reviews to see what people are saying about mm -hmm. them, and then making real decisions based on that information to improve their business. Um, for we work with a pizza chain, and they had a place that. Uh, they kept seeing their, their reviews were lower than, you know, all of the other uh, pizza chains or pizza restaurants around yeah. the country for the same brand. Yeah. Um, there's one, one location that just was really poor performing <laughs> and they're trying to figure out why that is. Um, and you, you know, they'd never done anything to really manage their reviews before, but um, sure enough, if you go and look at the reviews for that location, they can, they could see that um, their, that was closing or people were, writing that this location is actually closed when it says it's open on your site. Mm -hmm. um, and what was happening was, and there was a couple of different reviews like that. And so, um, you know, we called later in the day and on one of the days that they should be open, but we're actually closed um, and tried to figure out kind of why that was. And apparently the, um, the business, the office manager had been closing this pizza restaurant an hour and a half early almost every night because they didn't have any customers coming mm. in. Um, and that, you know, this pizza chain with over 300 different locations, it's really hard to know that if yeah. you don't have some tool in place that's like helping you yeah. measure the words of your customers. Yeah. Um, and that's. So, yeah, it's just funny that like you can, yeah. you know, this, the, the reputation of your business, like if you're managing it and kind of on top of it, um, can be super beneficial for you and you can learn a lot about about your business and that's relying but, yeah. on the 4% of people that do complain and do fill out surveys and do post things on Google and Yelp like do you post anything on Google and Yelp like not not but it's true that it's like not unless I had a really amazing experience yeah. or a really really bad experience so there's yeah uh, there's dissatisfied customers out there who are not you just don't know they're dissatisfied um, so some way of trying to you know indirectly identify who they are and then uh, study them and learn from yeah, them. And so if you're, I guess to your question around like dissatisfied customers, like we have a bunch of flags in our system that identify what customers are using in our, in our actual tools, right? So you can tell if yeah. a customer has been using this section heavily or that section heavily. Um, and when they haven't been using any of them heavily, <laughs> then that's a pretty obvious sign yeah. that they're, they're at risk, yeah. right? So you're, yeah, we've got different kind of flags that, usage flags in our tools that yes. can pretty clearly tell us when a customer is going to leave or if they're going to stay. Excellent. Um, so the problem though is, well, dissatisfied customers don't tell you that they're upset. They tell other people. Um, so Wells Fargo is the company oh, that the I hate. Thing, <laughs> the only other thing I'll say there is that we, any customer that churns, we send them out those surveys, okay, nice. you know, and again, like how many, like at that point they've already canceled. Yes. So, you're now trying to just gather information yes. on what you can figure out as to why they left. Yeah. Um, yeah. Trying to, trying to figure out those issues for future customers is super important. Yeah, I think overall, it sounds like you guys are doing a good job uh, trying to pick up on that, but most companies in terms of relative investment places, that's a place where they under invest and, you know, hiring someone to be fully focused on just that one problem of who are dissatisfied customers learning from them making amends if possible um, is a way to kind of buffer up your overall customer relationship management. It's all around like acquiring and retaining, but not enough around like understanding the customers who've been, who've left. Um, so this is kind of a old quote from uh, customer equity that we just are too obsessed with customer acquisition and uh, negligent about expansion and retention. And actually it's worse than that because sometimes in an effort to acquire a customer, we overpromise, and then the people that have to implement, the people that have to onboard, um, are now dealing with uh, kind of this customer whose expectations are just not feasible to satisfy. So actual acquisition efforts can make it harder for us to expand and retain um, customers. Um, where are you in terms of the the life cycle? Of, you're managing the customers for a long time, so you aren't just trying to win the account and yeah, pass I mean, them our off. Team, team kind of handles all the way from, you know, lead to, to close business. Um, to, you know, once we sign a deal and then we've got another customer success team, mm -hmm. so we call them over here at Moz that helps with the implementation and then 
know, continued success of a customer and is also responsible for just like you mentioned, like the retention and expansion of, you know, them buying other products with us yeah. and other services and things like that. Yeah, the the kind of crazy thing or the the one thing that seems to solve all problems of like over promising and under delivering is just making sure everybody gets compensation with the long term value of the customer, not just like Oh, you brought in the customer, so now here's your bonus, and you don't have to worry about if they stick around for a long time. Like making sure that yeah. the compensation is is built for the long term value of the customer, and for those people who initially bring in in the leads or who initially convert the leads into a new customer. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's you know for those larger accounts or larger deals, like there's usually just so much green grass available that if you manage those customers well and like. Mm -hmm treat them well and give them a good experience. You know, you talked about like the sales cycle and the procurement cycle for some of these brands being really long yeah. and that leads them to want to stay with you for longer. Yeah. Um, it's like, if you, if you go through a really long procurement process and do everything well, they're usually marketing teams are really resistant to want to go through that whole process again with some other group of vendors. Yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And that's another reason team. why you have to, as a firm, treat your existing customers really well that such that they're willing to invest because they're not like immediately as soon as you hire them looking to leave to go to another company because they're like if if i'm planning yeah. on having this job for six months i'm not going to invest in trying to win a client that it's going to be a five-month sales totally. cycle um, and, and you just mentioned something else it's like getting them to you know we're getting to retain those customers it's that after you make the you know after you sign the contract or whatever the first 30, 60, 90 days after that point are vitally critical yeah. to just get everyone ramped up on the tool set, make sure they're using everything, um, make sure every member of the team has the connection that they need. Like, yeah, there are little things you can do along the way to make sure that that process goes a lot smoother um, and that you do kind of retain these customers that are hard to, hard to come by. Yeah, I don't know why, but for some reason at UO, it seems like our team in charge of procuring software, like works with the vendors whatever but they never at least not me uh they probably do like say like hey faculty like will you go ahead and try these things out and give us feedback but we're always like not interested but then like they just like oh, okay here end user like here's this new tool and i'm like i'm already using the competitor's tool and i'm not going to give it up because it's like i know how to use it i like it and i have friends that use it so yeah um okay i think that was it yes we finished, my man. Um, nice. Uh, thanks for sticking with me and adding good commentary and insights from your industry perspective. I like to close um, with just hearing some of your advice you'd give to these these young ducks that are about to spread their wings and fly away. You know, that's, that's a good question. I mean, again, I was, I was kind of talking about this earlier, but looking back on my own career, it's like, try and find something that you are interested in. And I know that sounds stupid and everybody says that, yeah. but like if you can find a technology that you think is cool or a company that's doing something cool or working with cool customers, yeah. it's like I would just really try and find that company that, that is at least like semi-interesting to you beyond just like having a job. Yeah. Um, and then additionally, Wait, just... Uh, while well, you think of your next point, I just want to add to that. I think now, given that the economy is kind of shut down, it gives students more time to really discover things they like and find people in those industries that they admire um, and they would want to cultivate a relationship with. Because as soon as kind of the economy starts to pick up, it'll be slowly and there's going to be all this kind of pent up people looking for work that it's, yeah. it's going to be tough. So really having a, a kind of weird uh non-typical thing that like you see is going to be big but not everybody's focused on it yeah. yet I, exactly and like thinking did. about it from, you know you know i look back and it's like thinking about stuff that was that grew to be huge right like you look at like twitch yeah you know crazy. Uh, tv and it's like yeah obviously when i was when i was younger it's like being able to just watch stuff <laughs> yeah. streaming like video games like yeah that's awesome like why would this not become huh. a massive thing um, but it's like, I never thought of, thought about like, how could I get to be part of yeah. that company? Like, what could I do to work myself into a job to get yeah. there? Um, and so, yeah, I would just challenge you to do that. Like actually like be purposeful about yeah. you know, what you're, you know, what you're researching the companies that you're interested in. 
um, to try and find a path there. And then the other thing that you mentioned earlier was like, LinkedIn is awesome yeah. to the point that you can reach out to literally anybody in any industry. It, like, yeah. yeah, I would, I would highly recommend you use LinkedIn and leverage it um, to find people that are interesting or have an interesting career that you might want to do someday and ask them, say, Hey, been, been cruising LinkedIn <laughs> yeah. trying to figure out what I want to do with my yeah. life. Like, I think you have a cool job yeah. and spending 10 minutes talking to yeah. me and telling me about it. Like yeah. that, that would be something that I would have done more of um, had I been coming out of college right now. Yeah, I think that's a great uh, idea and that um, you can see kind of people's whole education career trajectory and just like interview them as just like an interesting person. I think um, most people are kind of flattered when someone shows interest in them. So they'll be willing to talk about themselves and, and just kind of get in their mindset. And then if you ask them, um, for advice, they might end up giving you help. If you ask them for help, yes. they'll give you advice. <laughs> you're not asking for a job, yeah. right? You're just asking, you're, you're trying to find something you're interested in and some mentorship, a, someone who, you know, you can see went to your school or is, or spent time in some hometown or just is in switched into an industry, like from an unrelated industry. And you can just tell them, ask them to share the, the story. So speaking of that, uh, Ian, someone watches this video and they're like, Hey, this Ian guy is pretty sharp and he's navigated, uh, the, the world from Amazon to Moz. Uh, I'd like to get some insight from him or have him give me some advice on my resume. If they reach out to you on LinkedIn, would that be a good idea? Yeah. That is the best place to connect with me. All uh, right, sure. so they can see how you spell your name right here. It's I A N, and then Telge, T E L G E. Thanks for your. Oh, there's only one of me. I don't think. Yeah, I like that. You're not Chris uh, Smith. First name, I think, uh, um, and you you have a duck connection. You come down to football games every so often too. I do. My wife is a, is a duck. Yep. For sure. Uh, what sorority was she? So hopefully, I'll see you in Eugene. Yeah. Uh, football game. If if we do it. Yeah. Me. If that goes down with a face mask, if not, I, I, I could watch a game over zoom virtually yeah. and maybe no, no fans in the stands. I <laughs> yeah. Don't know. yeah. We, uh, had a not so successful career as co gamblers on sports together. Uh, but anyways, it's a comedy of errors really like <laughs> you could have been way up if you'd just gone against Connor and I. <laughs> yeah. Well, the casino, the, the casino did that. Team. Yeah. Um, all right, well, uh, I'm going to pause this recording and then I'll say goodbye to you um, separately. But thank you, students, for watching and uh hope this was somewhat insightful and helpful. All right.